Welcome, everybody. Um, I must tell you, I'm a little bit nervous. So um, it's a very um, exciting audience. And I don't know what I can add to the good work we did this morning already. I'll try to make some comments and be provocative. Uh, that's what I usually try to do. Um, and I also uh, tend to talk very quickly, especially when I get excited. This is a topic I get excited about. Stop me. If I'm unclear, what, run off into some ways that uh, it's not as a clear a concept or something I'm working with, stop me again so we can have a dialogic kind of exchange instead of listening to a boring conversation. That's one way. Uh, what's interesting to me is uh, we talked about demystifying a moment ago, so I'm glad the proper title is up. The title, Queering Women in Agriculture, uh, is not about gay people farming. Uh, or raising animals, uh, or fishing. Uh, it's really about the concept of to queer something. It comes out of queer theory, and uh, it's an attempt to both get you interested in the topic by saying, what does that mean? But also uh, to really benefit from where I think gender and feminist research has moved conceptually. That we've gone from women's research to feminist scholarship, and I think now queer scholarship has really pushed us even further along. I mean, we th thought about, we talked about development, then we talked about underdevelopment, now we talk about imperialism, and now we talk about globalization. It's the same kind of intellectual progression about refining and thinking more in a nuanced way about some of the concepts we actually use. Now, I don't know how to move that, so. Maria, can I get you to sort of be my person? I'm a very low-tech person. Uh, I really take, uh, take the old-fashioned discussion as key to learning. Uh, and so I'm going to take you on a little journey with me. And the journey is really a historical journey. And this is, uh, I think, a very useful and helpful definition. And I'll read it out loud just because I think it's so critical. It says, at the root of queer theory is a very simple practice Questioning what is normal or normative, complicating any simple framework by asking critical questions about who is excluded and what is assumed. And I think this is part of the conversation already, so it's nothing really new, it's just given a different kind of flavor. Anyone who has studied queer theory immediately gets how this framework is useful beyond analyses of sexuality. Precisely because it offers a framework that does more than answer questions about sexuality, it allows us to critically interrogate any relation that is naturalized or presumed rather than specified, located, and historicized. Now, what, is, what does all that mean? It really, it seems to me, suggests that we walk around in our heads with assumptions. And those assumptions are precisely that, assumptions that we don't necessarily think about. So when we think about mothers and children, we make that kind of connection immediately. And when we find a gentleman or a father who's not drunk, but who's willing to do some work, that assumption says, oh, well, maybe men do so, some of these things too. So the gender division of labor is something we assume, whether or not the practice actually reflects it at any given moment. And when I say specified, located, and historicized, I really mean that there's no universal claim about this. In different contexts, we all have these different experiences. And as our, my group uh, indicated, we even don't use the same, we don't mean the same thing by the concept of gender. We all have different words to use or different ways of operationalizing, which is the key for us in terms of our research. How do we operationalize the notion of gender? What do we do to give it meaning, to give us a guide to do our research? Do we mean women? I used to say to many audiences that gender is the academized word for women. In other words, you never say, I just study women. But you say, I study gender. But you study women. <laughs> you know? And I think, Sarah, your, your comments was just very apropos. And then I studied, realized we should also include men. So gender becomes a variable, men and women. And I'm going to take you on a journey to show you that it could be more than that, or maybe something different than that. It's not that that's bad. It's that that's a piece of the puzzle. It may not be the whole puzzle. And there may be new ways of thinking about it. Do I do this one more time? Ah, so here's my little walk through history. 1970, many of you know Esther Basrop's book, Compared Asian and African Agriculture and Women's Role in It. We had a seminal work in anthropology that opened up a lot of this stuff. 
And many of you know Carmen Diana, whose work now is still on land tenure, but then she wrote something called Rural Subsistence in, Ca in the Capitalist Periphery. These are 1970s. We're still thinking about these things. The same people are still <coughs> writing. I mean, Esther's long gone, but other people are still writing. Barbara Lewis, a really important piece, <coughs> Invisible Farmers, a USAID pro uh, document. Okay, 1981, ahead of the curve. I'm not going to read all of them, but what you see here are very specific <coughs> interventions. Farming systems research in the 80s, very important to generate new ways of thinking about gender, but new ways of thinking about farming systems research as a system. Okay, and you have a whole host of the CGIAR institutions being at the forefront of these kinds of conversations. Right? And if you just take a glance at the titles, you'll see that we're still asking the same things. And that was now, I hate to say this, but 1970 was 40 years ago. <laughs> Four zero. Some of you weren't even born, I bet. <laughs> and so when we say that, we say, okay, where are we? What are we doing? Why do we forget our history to see if we can move forward on that history as opposed to stay backwards or just keep reproducing the same old donkey? You know, not against donkeys by any means. <laughs> so is there something called a next stage? I mean, if the next generation was, was used earlier, is there a way to go forward that adds to what we should know? And I say should simply because it's available to us. The language may have changed. We used to use women much more as a common you know, nomenclature, but now we might use gender. But we may still be doing the same thing over and over again. And precisely because we end up thinking about our, without thinking about our assumptions. We just take them for granted and we just don't push those assumptions to say, what new questions may emerge if I open those assumptions up? You know, I think what we have um, in a certain sense, well, let me just go through the, can you go backwards one more back? I'm sorry. Let's, here's the 90s. So we thought we were really ahead of the curve by the 90s. We should have known everything there was in the invisible women. Now women aren't invisible. But what do we do? We have a very different emphasis. So I think in our group we talked about is gender poverty, is gender about land, is gender about property. I think what we can see over the historical horizon is a sense that the substantive focus changes. So by 2000, we have something called the value of value chains and gender's relationship to value change. That wasn't the language of the 70s. Okay? But how we did the research may share much more with the 70s than what we think. In other words, value chains, while it's a new concept that's on the table, and I'm gonna let Deborah speak to her expertise in value chains, but the point is, sometimes the old models are just applied to new, to new topics. Climate change, gender, gendered effects of climate change, gendered effects of participatory action research and forest management. You know, but are those models themselves, are the tools that we bring, are the gendered understandings that we bring to the table different? And if they are, how are they different? And if they're not, how are they similar? And do we need to go, go in a different direction? Or do we need to push those similarities outward so we actually can add something new, some new ways, not of doing research and applying gender to something, to work more closely with a plant breeder who's sensitive, but to encourage the plant breeder and yourself, because here we're implicated, all of us with gender interest or gender expertise, we're implicated in bringing the same kinds of assumptions to the table. We are not outside of our assumptions. And I'll give you an example. So I'm in a little village and I'm sitting around talking to the woman of the household and she's winnowing rice. She's parboiling another batch of rice. Her foot's on a piece of rope that's making sure the birds are not eating the mangoes in the tree. And her husband comes down and we start chatting and I say, well, what does your woman do in agriculture? And he says, oh, in this country, women don't work. I said, that's probably true. They don't work. What do they do? And then he said, well, she parboils the rice. I say, how much is the market value of parboiled rice versus non-parboiled rice? Parboiled rice is much more common in Bangladesh than in many other parts of the world. And he says, oh, it's like 25 or 50 percent more, depending on where and what season and what kind of rice. Oh, so who adds the value to that? Whose labor was invested in that? Okay, the same thing with winnowing. The same thing with all the activities that women are doing. 
Was he lying to me? No. And that's what we have to make sure we, we don't get caught in. He wasn't lying. His perception of work was a particular kind. And I think, when I look at surveys of colleagues of mine, we do the same thing. How many hours did your wife work? Or how many hours did you work? Well, I only work part-time. Well, if it's under 20, we don't count it. Right, because it's not really labor force participation. And there are census, country censuses that actually stop it. At 20, if you don't work 20 hours, you're excluded. Well, lots of women don't work formally 20 hours, and therefore they're excluded. So in 1992, well, uh, is that the next one? Can you go to the next one? Thank you. I'm so sorry. So he, here are just three. I'll come back to these, actually, in a minute. But three animating questions to keep in mind. What are gender norms? And this is the, this is the embodiment, I think, of some of the assumptions that we carry forward. Okay? And then, what are the gendered practices? And that requires field work with eyes that can actually see what's going on outside of the categories we might bring to the table. Let me say that again. I look at a woman doing X in harvest, post-harvest work, and I watch her, and I do it. If I don't think that's work, I don't see it. I'm the same guy as the husband. I'm the same person as the husband who says, my wife doesn't work. So it's incumbent upon us as even gendered researchers, gender, gender too, but gender researchers, that we actually can see outside the categories or the norms that we associate with our assumptions. In other words, I'm inviting us all to think about the assumptions that we don't hardly talk about, because that's what makes it possible for us to communicate. We share assumptions. Okay? And once you open them up, you see differently. You literally, and I can say this without any doubt, you see differently. What you passed over because you didn't notice it, all of a sudden becomes visible. And I'm sure we all have examples like that. As soon as you sort of just think for a moment outside the box that you have, you all of a sudden say, oh yeah, that, I can count that as work. I can do that. And so um, let's go to the next one for a second. And this is something 1982, uh, Ruth Dixon, at that point married to Kingsley Davis, if people know demographers, um, very important person. And this is just, and I'm sorry it's so small, but this is just a list and there's, a, there's another one as well. Um, but here, leave this one up because this is Southern Africa, West Africa, East Africa, North Africa, and you know, sort of not surprising given our normative assumptions, the, the black lines indicate that work which was not included in ILO statistics initially of women's labor force participation in the, in the agricultural sector. So what the dark lines are are, are the, those investments that were not counted, and not surprisingly, Islamic North Africa is seen as the women most hidden and outside of agricultural production, and therefore you have the greatest increase if we <coughs> add those bits to the quote-unquote actual. Right? Now this is in 1980, and this is 1970 data. The book was written in 1981. I think it gives us a clue, even if it's very, very dated, to highlight what's not included very often. The other piece that I want to just emphasize here is that we think about production outside of reproduction. Because, and I'm not talking about reproduction making babies, which we have plenty of expertise in the room about. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the reproduction of the labor force, feeding the family, household gardens that don't get counted as work, even though women may spend a lot of time making sure that the household garden is rich enough to feed the family. Okay, so when you begin to open up the question of production in the narrow sense, which most of us, because of the ways in which funding streams and definitions of agriculture work, we tend to maintain that narrow definition of production. Once you tie it to reproduction, and you think of other ways of, the, the example of winnowing rice for consumption is an investment of labor to separate the shaft from the kernel, and what you have is women's labor invested in that. And yet, and I was part of this for many years, you know, you go to the field and some would say, we have this project to help women spend their la leisure time more productively. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, so they were standing around hanging out with their buddies and, you know, <laughs> chatting over tea, people who had not even one meal to eat a day for sure, and that's what they were doing. 
So we were going to fill the labor time, the leisure time, with real labor. But in fact, if you begin to link, and again, this is a conceptual shift in our heads, if you just shift to say, I have to include productive agriculture, that's for market, and say a subsistence household and how much they're producing for consumption, and all of a sudden the notion of work, the notion of labor, the notion of amount of time people have to do productive work diminishes significantly. Okay, so one of the things I'd like to leave us with as we chat is what does it mean when you're talking to a productive, I mean a, um, a plant breeder, when you're breeding, and the person, well yours is a good example because everyone now has it, you know, uh, crushing, grinding seed is very difficult in certain circumstances and maybe it's not the most appropriate thing to, to uh, breed for, but you do it anyway without recognizing that and you assume that women's labor time doesn't count, but if you just think about it in terms of labor time, what might it do? It may require new technology, of course, but it also may just require more time and many women don't have the time if you begin to think about it or if you begin to look at those kinds of questions. So what I'd like to invite you to think about is as we think about production, think about reproduction in relation to it. And it changes, I think, some of the things we can see and some of the things we understand. Uh, yeah? Keep going. I mean, that's just... Okay, sure. Um, so this is the Middle East, this is South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and the Caribbean. I'm sorry. I mean, the Middle East, again, is, you know, not surprising, the most underreported. A lot of it, I think, is because of the normative assessments that people make and assume. Uh, this is not a critique of anything. It's much more to show how much we lose by not being able to see or to count what the investment of women's labor time is. And that's basically why I, and there's nothing that's been done since I've looked, trust me, to try to get something more up to date. Uh, and I think this still signals what I think is so important. And if we can just take, there are studies that say if you add um, household work and uh, field work or, or uh, employment and field agriculture together, women do more per, you know, per day, hours per day than men do. Okay. There's a lots of those kinds of things in small located spaces. In the Philippines is a big example of that, where the, uh, the increase in numbers, uh, the amount, the number of hours that women work per day is very high once you add domestic labor to it. And domestic labor meaning not employment, but domestic labor. So, so can, you something, uh, yeah. can you explain the reasons for these regional differences or within the region between the countries? So whether they give any examples why North Africa is more hidden than Southern Africa or why Southeast Asia is less than South Asia? Well, if I want to be quick and dirty in my response, I'd say that the people who are collecting the evidence make assumptions. And so therefore, when someone says, my wife doesn't work, I agree, I believe it. And so the calibrations tend to be lower. So you say the, the cultural norms of the people who do but also the, the communities. So the guy didn't lie to me. He said, my wife doesn't work. If I'm not a, able to distinguish between a norm and a practice. Even the woman herself may not be reminded. She absolutely. I mean, I grew up with a mother who said, I'm only a housewife. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that mean? She cooked and she cleaned and she did everything to get me off to school and then off to university and so on. But she's only a house. It's one thing to say I'm a housewife. It's another thing to say I'm only a housewife, meaning I don't, sh I don't need to be recognized as somebody who makes an important contribution. I so the question should have been, uh, do you work? Or rather, should have, should have been, do you earn? Because if it's do you work, clearly somebody will be thinking of what they told the researcher. But the question is, do you earn? Okay, but let's assume that you're doing work that's hidden in the household, like this parboiling rice, and that woman doesn't see that as work because she doesn't earn. The rice goes to the market, exactly. fetches a different price, the husband gets the, gets the returns from the market, and she doesn't earn. I mean, here's another example. Women were doing um, soap one, one day, and I was trying to upscale their in, you know, activity, so I said, how much does it cost to produce soap? Well, it's not very much. Well, how much does it cost to parboil rice? Oh, not very much. How could it not be very much? Well, I use the same pots I use for cooking, so it doesn't cost me anything. And I use the fuel wood when I'm cooking, but of course you need more, but you don't notice the difference. 
So women themselves, I think this is very important, women themselves mark what they do as not important. And if I don't earn, I'm not doing, I, I think, uh, my, you know, my own sense is that asking about work is better than asking about earnings because the market is not in everybody's face all the time. And so you're doing labor that you might count if you'd, even if you didn't earn anything. But <coughs> assumptions, custom, practice, you know, being embarrassed that you're working, you don't want to say that my wife works because that means you can't afford to keep her in the way in which you should given your status in the community. So you don't want to tell people you, you, your wife is working. I mean, this happens at least in South Asia that I know, but I think there are generations in the 50s of working class men who wanted their women at home. You know, in the US, in Europe. So this is not anything that's associated with any one place. I think your question is really important. I think these are culturally ascribed spaces, but what's, what I'm trying to argue is those are assumptions that we also reproduce, and we don't know how to puncture them to find out if it's any different. I think you had your hand up first and then. Um, do, do you find that time use surveys um, help shed more light? Or I'm, I'm curious what your take is on that. And the care economy and the emerging feminist conversation. About yeah, 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 yeah. Economy, yeah. I'm curious what your take on that. And if that can be useful in this space. I think it can be useful, but I'm a little bit skeptical because half the people, the women I know, village women in particular, have the kid on their lap while they're doing something and they're counting one activity, the dominant activity. So uh, the example I gave you earlier is if your, foot's, uh, if your foot is doing this to get, keep the birds off the tree, does that count as work? Does that count as an activity? You might have to hire a child to do it, but you don't think about it. So I think um, it's useful. I think it, it's a start to go down that street of what other ways to know. I think the work on the care economy is spectacular precisely because it's valorizing activities that don't count. And especially among urban working and middle class people who if you don't have a parent at home to help with the child care, you're sunk. If you don't have a, a, sibling, a, a child to take care of you in old age, you're sunk. And all of a sudden those are adding burdens to households where people lived in communities in the rural areas, they're now living more individuated lives, and it becomes more clear that these are really activities. But in the villages, you know, someone's always around to take care, you know, and, there's, and so I think marking it as an arena of research is really critically important. How it actually would function in an agricultural research project, I'd have to give it more thought. But in terms of where to look, I think these are brilliant suggestions. Carol, you had your hand up, you, and then. Absolutely. Not any assumptions, and also you can deal with multiple activities. It's a little harder in the analysis part, but at least it comes out when people are doing more than one thing at a time. If you're willing to see it. Yeah. A guy will come in and say, my wife's not working. No, I mean, he's not, not seeing something different. No, you have to look and see what Yeah, you mean. have to look and see. You have to look and see. It all depends upon how you define what is work. Absolutely. It's a perception of work itself. Right. Well, I wish it was only a perception that we didn't, but here we have an opportunity to interrogate that and then become more clear about what we mean in any given case. Sarah, you had your hand up. Well, I was going to speak to Jacqueline's point about asking about work or earning, and, and then you kind of covered it by saying time allocation. So in, in our studies, we're always asking moms from when you woke up yesterday to when you woke up this morning, like kind of what was your main activity for, for every hour of the day? So at least you can get it differentiating between leisure and light work and mm -hmm. heavy work. And I think there's one more category, but, but at least you can see exactly the burden. And by asking about time allocation, it, it takes away kind of the connotations of, of earnings. And then I wanted yeah. to ask you if you could recommend some literature on, on the economy of care. Uh, Martha, I, mean, I know the U.S. literature, or the <coughs> European U.S. literature. I don't have enough on, on inter, you know, it's more larger thing. Yeah, so that would be great. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking maybe we could permit Shelley to first finish her presentation and then we can ask the questions. Okay, I, I just want to end soon because I, I'd rather have time to entertain questions. But I guess what I would like to sort of close with is um, we can get rid of that quote and I can share it with somebody else. The, the, that I, I mean, what's interesting about that quote merely is that 
It's a, it's a 19, it's 2014 document. Many of you have seen it, I'm sure. Uh, what is it? It's the leveling of agriculture. And the problem with it is that I don't think it's a problem. I think it alerts us to not much has changed. And that's what I was trying to, to, to show in that. But let me just uh, talk about, um, uh, if you could move to the next one. OK, L and then I have one more, and then I'll, I'll close. Uh, I think, and this has been a popular term about business as usual, and everyone, and I, and I would surmise that, or at least I'll give my hand away and say, I think we tend to do business as usual. And I think what we really need to do is think, as we said earlier, outside the box. This was put up well before I got up here with this crazy mic in my hand. Um, it was really about what does it mean to think outside the box? How do we shake our assumptions, question what is normal? And I use the word normal in inverted commas because normal is what might exist in X place or Y place, South India versus Bengal, two very different worlds, two very different social histories, two very different political histories, two very different economic histories, right? They're very different places. So when people talk about Africa, I always have to ask, where? You know, because I even do it in South Asia, you know, and, um, and India's so-called one federated state. So difference matters, history matters. When you're looking at something, okay, if you and where you're looking, okay? But I suggest an alternative research strategy is required if we are to better understand agricultural production. And here I just put noting this, that most early research on gender was on in crop production. Then it went a little bit to livestock. And there was something that came out that I read the other night in 2014 by this guy, Curry, who basically said, oh, we don't do gender and animal research. And I mean, you know. Uh, but but it's, it's less prominent than crop production. And then that's more prominent than fisheries and forestry. And we have experts in this room about all of those. So how do we in, contribute, and I would argue, to the sustainability that we all care about for feeding the world's poor, uh, not to conflate gender and poverty, but to think that those goals are important. And I want to just close with the next one. Yes, OK. So one of the things that. I, I've just truncated, so I can give it to, more to, um, to, to conversation. But I think some of the more recent developments has been the really criticality of ag nutrition linkages. Uh, at least, you know, at Cornell this has been happening. IFPRI, you know, sort of centered on that. Um, the nutrition groups at uh, Cornell are centered in that. And so that bec that's something new. Nutrition was not necessarily directly linked to agriculture earlier on. Agricultural, agroecological agro practices. Again, we're fortunate here. We have a uh, Department of Natural Resources. They're pushing this. There's a new major in, um, <coughs> sci what is it called? I can't remember the name of it. Huh? Sustainability. Yeah. Uh, and, so, and there's lots of interest. So we're moving in that kind of, on that kind of terrain. I put this up here because we're, in some ways, and this is probably a more heretical statement, so bear with me and please feel free to disagree. Uh, you know, we're, we're thinking that the gene revolution and the green revolution, you know, are sort of parallelisms, one in the 60s and one in the 2000s. And yet we're forgetting the history of the costs of some of the green revolution technology. Not that it, the intention was to be bad or that it was negative, but that there were costs. There were especially environmental costs. And here, we depend on soil scientists to know what's going on. Here, we depend on agronomists to know what's going on. Here, we depend on breeders to know what's going on. So this is a perfect site for us to be, really be uh, working towards collaboration. But it's clear that we have to learn from those past events so that we avoid them in the future. Okay, so it's not the same thing, but it alerts us to some of the costs. And climate change is a key response. Soil uh, degradation is a key recognized response, and so on. So uh, I'm putting those up there, are, are, are some of the key issues. The second is, you know, I think we've moved into questions of food security um, that we didn't think about in quite the same way earlier, and that's a key issue. Questions of sustainability, quite an important uh, issue. And here I think of not only sustainability of the agroecological environment, but the lives and livelihoods of producers and of consumers. 
I mean, it's only possible when we can assure, ensure that people can buy food and grow it in ways that sustain their lives and their livelihoods. And we shouldn't forget livelihoods. I think the fantastic work, and I'm biased, on assets, gender, uh, gender and assets, opening it up to earnings, from earnings to a broader template of, access, of, of assets uh, is really important. The question that I think the work that Carmen signaled earlier and some of the early questions about land ownership are now right on the mark in terms of rights and property rights and how property should be thought of in more gendered sensitive terms. And then I was alerted, I think, to, to uh, your point, Monica, about agribusiness and the ways in which new questions are emerging about, you know, I remember the Tanzanian tomato uh, women who would get on the trains with these huge um, baskets of, not baskets, they were bigger than baskets, of tomatoes to go into the towns to sell. What's changed? How, if that's upgraded, how is it differentially affecting people? But my most important kind of uh, thing I want to leave you with, and for me this is the most important, is gender is not a variable, it is a relation. Now let me just take two minutes to, to say something, maybe a minute. I put on the table earlier production and reproduction. But I heard a lot this morning about, well, we have to deal with women, but we also have to deal with men. And that to me is a gendered variable. Why aren't we actually reimagining that relation as a unitary relation? Not the same thing, but it's a relation. Once you use relational concepts, you're looking and you're seeing different things. So this is not a critique by any means. But I, and I think the point is well taken. You know, in the 70s, the argument was, do we have only women's groups? Do we have joint groups? Do we have mainstreaming? Do we not have mainstreaming? What's the cost of men and women working in the same group? Women are going to get lost. They're not going to speak as much, da 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 we learned from all of that, from the research point of view now. From a, from a project intervention point of view, we can have a discussion about what works best in any given circumstance. You know, is it a, a women's group versus a joint group? From the research point of view, and that's the only claim I'm making here, is that a relational analysis changes what you see and how you look at it. And it moves from gender as a variable that we can add women, men to, because that's the other half of the variable. And what queer theory does is unsettle those normal categories. And that's why I liked what queer theory offers us. It says, take what's normal. The world is divided between men and women. And implode that. Think about it in new ways. It's not that there aren't men and women. It's that how do we think about them differently? And what does that offer us as a point of entree to talk to people, to talk to our collaborators who are sci you know, uh, scientists, biological scientists, as opposed to social scientists? What might that help us do? How might it avoid, you know, the, and I loved your quote before, the Covey quote about thinking about the ends before you get there? Uh, begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. I mean, that's brilliant because the end in mind is including everybody, including the consumers. We often think about production agriculture. We also have to think about the consumers, what people like. Challenging assumptions means questioning what we take for granted and using that questioning in a productive and imaginative way. And what I'm trying to emphasize there is not so much to say the way you think is wrong or bad or unuseful, but maybe it's limited. And if we can begin to be open, to think, to you know, sort of be scared and jump on, you know, go into the, on the diving board and go out to the edge, tip over, and say, you know, maybe it's not so bad if I jump. And just jump a little bit, a little leap of faith, and see if it does anything for your research. All I'm trying to do here is get you excited by how much more we can be doing because we are all so skilled already. How can we just push ourselves beyond 1971 or 5 or 1986 or 1992 and think differently about something, whether the something is property rights or corn production? And the last is that we think about uh, multidisciplinary practices can assist in accomplishing goals that we establish to improve production lives and livelihoods. And I think sometimes for me, what gets lost are the lives and the livelihoods. And, and that's why I think we had this very nice discussion, which I want to thank you for raising about sometimes gender is equal to poverty. You know, sometimes gender is equal to leisure or work and not income. And I think if you begin to think with your collaborators in this more productive way, I think what you have is a way to put people back in the picture.
And instead of worrying about gender as a only women, if we put gender in the picture, then we're dealing with the lives and livelihoods of human beings who produce the world for us, but also consume it. And it goes back to, to I think, Monica, your comment about you know, bring the community in, inclusive kinds of questions that give people a stake. And I think people have a stake if they know it's going to improve a whole host of things, whether it's nutrition or it's the, the science of understanding soil erosion or, or nitrogen depletion better and differently, and how to make changes in that, is to recognize the range of activities that people engage in and incorporate them in how we think. So I'll end there, but just keep in mind that gender is not a variable. And I think I'd be really happy if people can think that it's more than that. It can be used that way at different times. Right? But if it's only used that way, in other words, let me, maybe I can close with the question, can one do a gendered analysis without looking at women? You probably know my answer, but think about it. Say something. Yeah, great. <laughs> I think so. I think so. I can study a museum through a gendered lens, through a feminist lens, through a queer lens. And I think I see differently. I will bring different understandings to the table. Then if I said, oh, there's no women in that museum, I don't have to worry about it. You know? uh, so I think once we say that, then we're using an analytic. We're not using gender as a variable. And I think we can all, you know, yeah, right is precisely where we should be at. If it's true, then what are the categories we are using to do our research that both makes possible but also may constrain the conversations we have with a breeder or a soil scientist? Can we have a different kind of conversation if we include women, deal with the specific effects of particular populations who have been excluded, and that excluded population could be migrant laborers? Right? But it's a way to deal with a whole range of issues by opening up that scary box of one and one is not always two, of you know, gender is not always women. It's a way of seeing the world and what you can include. So you can include reproduction as well as production. Because most productive activities require reproduction. In fact, I'd say every productive activity requires reproduction, because you need that person to produce. So it's not only biological, it's fed and schooled and trained. So it affects directly extension opportunities. Right? It, it, it extends to the range of activities that we do in agricultural research. And I will shut up. <laughs> Thank you very much.